Thank you all for coming. My name is Jim Molinelli. I'm the remodeling professor. I'm glad you're here tonight to go over this particular seminar. And we're going to cover remodeling uh, basics for kitchen design, part one. So let's get underway. I am thankful you're all here. And this is an exciting topic. In my book and in my course, I do cover the remodeling process from beginning to contract, but I do not specifically cover kitchen and bathrooms. So they are a little bit different and there are some uh, things that you want to be aware of before you ever pick up the phone to call anybody, whether that's a kitchen designer, an architect, a remodeling company, it really doesn't matter. You wanna do some homework first and tonight we're gonna to go over all the kinds of things that you need to know about your kitchen uh, before you lift up the phone to call. So let's get started. Kitchen design basics. There are some major kitchen decisions and on the notes, if you get the outline, you'll see all eight of them listed along with a couple of uh, minor points. We're gonna cover eight points tonight. They include the method of cooking, the list of major appliances, the type or types of kitchen eating, islands and peninsulas, cabinet information, types and number of sinks, countertop material preference, and floor material preference. So let's get underway. The first thing we'd like to look at is the method of cooking. You see, when I help a client prepare for a kitchen remodel, that's the first question of interest to me. The difference between a stove or range and a cooktop and a wall oven is significant, not only in the amount of space it takes and the two different locations required for the cooktop and wall oven, but in the price to the customer as well. There's more electric and or gas charges, there's more appliance costs, and there's more installation costs. And wall ovens also require a very expensive tall cabinet. So it makes a big impact in my understanding of the kitchen and the space arrangements of the kitchen as well as your final cost. So your preference in that area is very important. Also with stoves and ranges and with cooktops, there's a wide variety of sizes available. So it helps a great deal to know what you're planning. Are you planning a traditional 30 inch wide four burner stove or range? Or are you planning a five burner stove or range? Or an extreme uh, stove or range, an upscale model? Or is your cooktop perhaps going to be six burners? In those cases, we allot more space to those items. And that's why this is number one, the method of cooking. So let's take a quick look at some of these so that you get a, a good understanding. So again, whether it's gonna be a range or oven, it could be gas, it could be electric, it could be 30 inches, 36 inches, could be 42 inches, 48 inches, as many as 60 inches for some of the larger professional styles. Now again, I'm not saying that you have to go out and shop for this and know what you're buying ahead of time. This is a preference. Everybody going into a kitchen remodel has to have some kind of basic understanding of whether they wanna cook with electric or gas, and they have to have some understanding of whether they're gonna get a traditional range with four burners or something with five or six or more burners. Those are the questions I'm asking you to have at the ready. So that's specifically it, not the brand, not the color, not the material, not the model number. If you don't need any of that, you probably haven't done any shopping at all. What I'm looking for is your preference. Are you going to choose a range or oven or are you going to cook, cook on a cooktop and have wall ovens? And then of course, will there be any extra ovens in the kitchen? So cooktops and wall ovens, let's take a quick look at those. There's a pair of stacked wall ovens dead center here. Um, that is a traditional arrangement with two completely separate ovens uh, and the, the panel that controls them. The two drawbacks or three drawbacks of this style 
is that this cabinet that it goes in, as I mentioned, is a very expensive cabinet, 1800 to uh, three or $4,000, depending upon the style of your kitchen cabinet. Also, when you buy a unit that includes two ovens in a single package, generally they're wired together. And if anything goes wrong with either one, it's possible that you'll have to replace both or replace the controller for both. So sometimes it pays to get a separate oven on top and a separate oven below, but then you have two appliance costs. So again, that's for you to decide. What you see on the right are cooktops. In this case, they're both electric, uh, but what I wanted to show you was this cooktop is stacked over an oven. So if this kitchen had a pair of ovens in a wall oven and another oven below the cooktop, they have three ovens. That's one way to get an extra oven in the room. This particular cooktop is mounted in an island. You can see in the background, they have their wall ovens as they turn the corner. What I wanted to point out here, it comes up later in our discussion tonight, is the style of venting. This is called a snorkel or a pop-up vent. And this draws air about nine or 10 inches high uh, from on the top of the pots and pans, and it works very efficiently. This works only if the cabinet is stretched away from the wall by the depth of the unit, which is usually three to five inches, or if it's in an island like you see it here. But very efficient, does not require a drop-down hood over the island in this case. All right. So those are some more ovens and wall ovens. Next item, is there going to be an extra oven? Now here you see in this particular instance, the same style of cabinet. It's a tall oven cabinet with an oven completely separate from a built-in microwave oven. And in this case, a convection microwave. Another way you can get an extra oven is to place it under the countertop when you already have wall ovens like we have here. Here's another example. They've got a custom range back here, but they've got a separate oven and a separate microwave oven under the counter elsewhere in the kitchen. So again, what's important to me, to the architect, to the designer, to the contractor, is how are you going to cook? What is your method of cooking? Will you use conventional ranges? What size will they be? How many burners? Then will you use uh, an extra oven, or will you use a cooktop in combination with some wall ovens? So that's the first big piece of information. So when you do decide if it's going to be an oven or range, the information important to me would be gas or electric, and how, what size and how many burners. If you're going to use a cooktop, the number of burners, the width and the fuel, again, gas or electric, and the wall ovens, how many ovens will there be? What's the width? And are they going to be electric? Typically wall ovens are. You can have gas ovens even in a wall oven. All right, moving on to number two, the rest of the other major kitchen appliances. See, I don't only need to know your cooking, but that's the number one. That's the biggest investment and the biggest space hog of all the appliances. So I need to know that first. Some of the others include the refrigerator and or freezer. So with the refrigerator, it's the type or style and the size. In almost no case today would a kitchen remodel be done that the width of the refrigerator is 36 inches or less. Uh, we have kitchens, uh, many that I've seen through the years when I've been doing projects that have 30, 32, 33 inch refrigerators. And if it was custom built and squeezed in to a small kitchen, people say, well, I don't wanna to go to a bigger refrigerator. Never do a kitchen remodel with an undersized refrigerator. Even if you wanna keep the one that you have, if it's fairly new, build it in such a way that when that refrigerator dies, you can plug in a 36 inch fridge. That's the standard dimension. If you're going larger than that, then you need to let your designer know. And that's why it says style size. Size is important for the width. Now, if you're going upscale in your kitchen, many refrigerators come with freezer pairs. And I'll show you what that is as we look at them here. 
you have a refrigerator and you have a, a freezer in a pair and you can go either way. Same thing here, refrigerator and freezer. The big name brands that you've heard of, Sub-Zero, Wolf, uh, some of the others all come with that style uh, where you can buy one or you can buy the other or you can buy both. Of course, you can always do what's shown here and buy a refrigerator with a freezer drawer, another refrigerator with a freezer drawer. This happens to have a pantry between it and an island behind it, which makes loading and unloading easy and allows you to get all the food you might need to prepare a meal. The styles of refrigerators that are still available are a top door, bottom freezer, and the, the reverse of this with a top freezer and bottom refrigerator. Then you have the side-by-side, -side, which is quite a traditional number. Um, this is great if you are in a space-limited kitchen because the doors are not three feet across. This drawer is very large, very deep, and very wide. This door is very wide. When these are open, uh, this drawer and this this drawer and this door, it, it takes up three feet of kitchen space and you have to provide extra space to travel when the refrigerator door is open or when the freezer drawer is open. The side-by-side -side doesn't do that. The, the bigger door is, is probably about 20 or 22 inches, which doesn't take up nearly as much space as this door when it opens. Then what's become prevalent in the last 10 or so years is the French door style upper refrigerator with the drawer freezer. So which style are you going to use and what size are you going to use and will there be a refrigerator in tandem with a freezer in your new kitchen? This is important. This is the information I need. Once again, it's not the material, the color, the brand, the model. It's not any of that information. It's just what's your preference for refrigerator freezer. Next item, the microwave. Will your microwave be on the counter, under a cabinet? Will it be a drawer unit microwave? Will it be over the range as a venting unit? Or will it be built in with a trim kit? Those are the five typical styles that we'll see, and let's show you what those look like here. Once again, we saw this a little bit before. This is an oven built into a wall oven cabinet. This is a microwave built into the same wall oven cabinet, and this piece around the outside is what's called a trim kit. Microwave ovens don't come 30 or 33 inches wide, which is the typical width of these cabinets. So they manufacturers that make built-in units do a trim kit. So in your case, you would have to buy the unit, which has a, a price tag based on the manufacturer, the model, the, the number of features, and you would have to buy the trim kit so that your contractor could custom cut the hole for it and embed it into the wall oven along with an oven, okay? We have the on-the-counter type of microwave, which we're all familiar with. But in most remodeled kitchens, we're looking to eliminate things that live on the countertop and build them in. So if that's the case, please let your designer know if you're going to have a countertop microwave oven and you have to set aside and dedicate a space where that will be so that it can get the proper electric uh, service and it doesn't interfere with cooking and preparing meals. Under cabinet microwaves, and venting over the range microwaves are a lot alike. The typical venting over the range microwave like you see here uh, is 30 inches wide to fit over top of a four burner electric or gas range. So that's the typical application as you see it here. These can recirculate the air and blow them out through uh, vents or they can vent out the wall or up through a duct through the ceiling. So they can be external venting or recirculating. These can also, like all microwaves, be a traditional microwave, a convection microwave, or some other type of cooking. Uh, for instance, GE has Advantium, which cooks with light. So there are multiple kinds of cooking that are available in microwaves, which is why they make a great second or third oven in a built-in case. What's become prevalent in the last few years is a drawer style microwave. And the reason I'm showing this to you with drinks on it 
is because we do microwave liquids a lot. And I want you to understand that you cannot yank this door open or push this drawer closed the way you can with the door on a countertop unit, uh, over the range unit, or an in the wall built in unit. This must be done by using the buttons and the mechanics of the drawer itself so that the liquids don't slosh and the items don't tip and spill. There is a danger of spillage. In a microwave in this location, it's great for adults, but it's bad for kids. Uh, they're working up over their head and above their eye level usually to take hot chocolate or hot cereals or soups out. This is great for a whole family because anybody can reach it regardless of age and mobility. However, you do have to be aware that the drawer moves very slowly in and out on a gear ratio and you don't want to alter that by grabbing the handle and yanking. The best feature on a drawer microwave is actually the flip up um, keypad. And that lets you see what you're doing without having to bend way over under the countertop, because you know the countertop is at about 36 inches off the floor, which puts this at about 30 or 31 inches off the floor, which means you have to fold yourself in half to get down there to push the buttons. This feature, not available on all drawer units, is a real blessing so that you can tip the unit up, see what you're doing, and work from above. So those are the, the microwave types that you'll be choosing from. The next item in the other major appliances, item number two that we're covering, dishwashers. Basically there's two. There's a standard dishwasher that you see there, 24 inches wide, goes up underneath the countertop, and there are drawer dishwashers, which can stack like you see here or be installed elsewhere separately. Uh, generally speaking, you like to keep these items near the sink. Uh, the reason is because there's plumbing. There's both supply plumbing of hot water and there is waste plumbing of the used water. And traditional location is just to the left or just to the right of the main sink in the kitchen. So just let your designer know which style of dishwasher you're planning on. Spatially, neither one takes more unless you spread the dishwashers out in the drawer style. Uh, but price-wise, the traditional dishwasher runs anywhere from $300 to $1,500. These start uh, well over $1,000 and go up. So there is a, a financial consideration there. The next item, the fourth item on major kitchen decisions list the other major appliances are some other items. Hood. How are you going to vent your cooking? Whether there will be or not be a trash compactor, ice maker, or wine cooler in your new, in your new kitchen. So quick, quick look, hoods. Hoods come in many styles. They are very, very large. Remember the first island cooktop I showed you had a snorkel, a pop-up variety back here, as opposed to an overhead hood. If you have a look that you're interested in, this one's modern with a curved glass, this one is a more traditional look but with stainless steel, all of them come with lights and with venting controls. This one too, lights and venting controls, a much larger unit. All of these have to duct up through the ceiling and then to the exterior. This one could go through the wall or up through the cabinet and out. But these are external venting. And then the only other one I have a picture of is the wine cooler. In a case like this, if you plan to build one in, either to a butler pantry, a kitchen, or a wet bar, uh, please have some idea what size it will be so that we can dedicate enough space for it. The same would be true if there's going to be an ice maker, if there's going to be a trash compactor. Uh, just let your designer know that it's coming and get them a size as quickly as you can. So that was item number two. The first was the method of cooking. The second was the list of major appliances. And the third is the types of in-kitchen eating that you plan on doing. So will there be table seating in the kitchen? And if so, how many people will you tr be trying to seat at that table? Will there be counter seating at either an island or a peninsula? And I just wanna give you a glimpse at some of the ways these can work. Table seating, obviously most people seat a small, fairly small table, something that seats four, 
something that seats five or six. Uh, here you see a table that, that easily seats eight and could seat more. Um, this is used as an island as well as a table and they just happen to have a lot of space. So it's one interesting idea. Here you see a traditional table. In this case, there are three chairs down one side, a bench down the other, and then there'd be a chair or a bench and a chair at the ends. Uh, this could seat as many as eight pretty easily, although because the bench is built in, it's not expandable. On the other hand, this is a rather small U-shaped kitchen with a peninsula, and it's a very clever use of the back of the peninsula since they knew they were not gonna have island or bar seating here, and they probably ran out of dining room uh, originally, and this was a great way to compact the two spaces together. The next one is a custom built-in, and you'll notice that this particular table comes right off the countertop. It is at 36 inches off the floor, countertop height. It has a pedestal to hold up the stone top, or whatever top it happens to be, and there is some kind of frame underneath as well for support because stone can't span that far and most other products can't either without support. But uh, in this case, there is essentially table seating out here at the front and there is bar seating in the back. Then in this case, they've taken the island top and extended it. Once again, that's at 36 inches high, but what they've done is they've put high stools so that they have a table which is exactly a part of their island. Very interesting take on the way to eat in an eat-in kitchen. This way it's at the island, but it's not the traditional bar stool eating. And then of course, as I say, there is traditional bar stool eating. In this case, they've raised it. You see the sink and the working part of the countertop back inside the kitchen, and this top is actually raised another five or six inches, which is a typical bar height of about 41 or 42 inches off the floor with the tall stools on the exterior. This is a great way to eat, and in this particular design, they did a very good job because these two people are looking at right angles at these three people, and conversation across the corner is very easy, where conversation in a straight bar situation is awkward. If you're only seated on one side of an island, you have to lean in and turn 90 degrees to have a conversation to the side. This is a very conversational kitchen, and a large number of people could be out here and not conflicting with the preparation of the meal inside. So, all that to say, if you're going to have in-kitchen eating at a table, please determine how many chairs uh, and people you want to serve on a daily basis at that table. And if you're going to have seating at either a peninsula or an island in your kitchen, again, determine that in advance and let your designer know. Item number four in the kitchen decisions that we're covering tonight, will you have an island or peninsula? And again, will there be seating at that island or peninsula? And the further question is, will you cook on the island? Will you eat on the island? Or will you have uh, sinks and other appliances on your island? So let's take a look. The first and most common traditional island is a working only island. It may have some cabinets underneath for storage. It may have some stools for eating, but it has a clear top that can be used for preparation of food, eating of food, and projects in the kitchen. This happens to be a peninsula. It looks like an island and it functions like an island, but this side is against a wall. So just like the state of Florida is against the mainland of the United States and Florida is itself a peninsula, this is not an island, this is a peninsula. It has seating on one side, storage on one side, working on the third side, and it's a great unencumbered top. The only hindrance is way over in that corner where that sink resides. And that gives them a large surface for eating, for preparing, and for other projects that they may do in the kitchen itself. Then, just like we saw a moment ago, the idea that a large island has an extension for table use. So they're 
dining table is back here, but their kitchen eating is done here. And again, the opportunity to see people across from one another or at right angles to one another makes this conversationally an excellent idea. Then we have a, a more traditional arrangement where on the outside of the kitchen, looking back in, we have bar stools of different types at the countertop height. Now this countertop appears to be the same 36 inch height as the rest of the kitchen tops, which means these are slightly shorter stools than these. But uh, you can arrange to have kitchen tops at different heights for eating, and that's what this shows you. In this case, the island and the worktops in the kitchen are at 36 inches, but this particular top is down at 30 inches or perhaps even 29, which is a standard table height. So they could pull up regular eating chairs that would be done in any kitchen or dining room and put them right here and eat at this surface. That's what that surface height change was made for, was so that they could put chairs around it. Obviously, the photographer, when they were taking this particular picture, uh, removed the chairs for whatever reason, perhaps they weren't photogenic, and put a couple of tree stumps indicating that they would be used as stools. I don't advocate that you use tree stumps as stools in your kitchen, but if this is something that interests you so that you can use regular dining chairs to eat in a kitchen, it certainly works. You can even drop a top at the end of an island down to that same 29 or 30 inches high and then use conventional chairs there as well. So that's kitchens and peninsulas. Please let your designer know if you'll be doing kitchens, uh, peninsulas and islands in your kitchen. Now the next major decision, the fifth of eight that we'll cover tonight is cabinet information. One of the things that I like to get on a first meeting with a client is these four pieces of cabinet information. Which wood or other material do you want your cabinets to be made from? If they are wood, which finish do you want? Do you want paint? Do you want stain? Will there be a glaze on the paint or stain? Or in the event you're going with another material, that probably means you're using a laminate. Then the cabinet door style. There are three basic styles of cabinet doors. We covered this in great detail last week. If you missed the cabinet session last week, the replay is available on the website. Cabinet door styles, there are three, slab door, raised panel, and flat panel. So if you have a preference of which of those three, please let your designer know. And then the fourth piece of information related to cabinets is the door type. Will it be a standard overlay, a full overlay, or a flush inset door? Now let's take a look at these four and what they are so that you're aware and you can make those determinations. So here we go. We're looking for the wood or material. We're looking for the finish on that wood. We're looking for the door style and the door type. Uh, cabinets come in many species of wood. You can get them in oak, and you can get them in quarter sawn oak, you can get them in maple, you can get them in birch, you can get them in a multitude of different woods. Every manufacturer and every line has a variety to choose from. Those are the species of wood. If you're going to stain your wood, you want a better and better grade of wood so that it takes the stain and shows a beautiful grain. If you're going to paint your wood, you can go with one of the less costly woods because you won't see the grain, you'll see the paint finish. So now the finish to the wood. One form of finish is stain and each type of wood gets a whole variety of colors that it can be stained to look like. So you need not buy a cherry cabinet to get a cherry look. You can buy a maple or a birch cabinet and have it stained cherry as well. The other cabinet finish, the most prevalent one today after stain is painting. Uh, literally, they just make the doors, they make the cabinet boxes, and they paint them. Then, with either the paint finish or the stain finish, you can get a glaze. And you see in this particular door a darker golden brown set of lines. That is the glaze. 
the glaze is put on after the painted cabinet is made or after the stained cabinet is made and it highlights all the crevices and cracks and the details in your door that you have picked. The next item, of course, is the door style. The door style can be a flat panel like you see in this photograph. It can be a raised panel like you see in this photograph or it can be a slab door like you see in this photograph. If you have a strong preference for one or the other, please let your designer know. So you're gonna tell them which wood you're leaning towards. You're gonna to tell them whether you're thinking stain or paint and whether you'd like to consider a glaze. Then you're gonna tell them which panel style or slab that you'd prefer. And the final item is the type of overlay. Standard overlay means that you can see the face frame around the door and drawer. Full overlay is a more European look where the drawer and door fill up the entire space and you really don't even get a glimpse of the frame through the, the gap here. And then inset or flush inset, the drawer and the door are inside and flush with the frame itself. This is by far the most expensive of the three. Now again, part of the things that, that I'm asking you to prepare in advance tonight are things that will help your designer, your architect, your contractor, to understand the spatial needs of your kitchen. How much space to allot for this item, for that appliance. Uh, you know, whether we need to have extra space because you're having a wall oven separate from a cooktop. Part of what you're telling them is to advise you on cost because before the meeting's over, they're going to ask, what is your budget? And you're going to tell them and you're going to undoubtedly ask the question today or shortly afterwards that says, is my budget likely to be sufficient for the things that I've asked for? Well, these four items that we're talking about here and several of the others that we're about to talk about are important to know in order to understand where the cost is headed. As I mentioned, the inset or flush inset style of door is more expensive, and it's more expensive by a large margin than these two door styles. The glaze, whether it's on paint or whether it's on stain, is a very expensive extra option. And then the wood that you select can be a very expensive option. So by your informing the designer and the contractor what your preferences are, they will be better able to help you understand where your price is headed and how much space they need to take up with your requests. The sixth item in the eight that we're looking at here, the major kitchen decisions, are the type and number of sinks. This is usually very easy. Most of us are going to have one sink in a kitchen. In a large kitchen, you very well may want to have a second sink, and we'll look at that here. So will there be single or double basin sink? What style of sink? What material? And what is the purpose of your different sinks? Over here, you see a bar sink, a secondary sink. This is not the main sink in the kitchen. This is probably used to allow the family and guests to uh, refill their drink or rinse off something. Uh, and it is a, probably well away from the main sink in this particular kitchen. Here you see a very traditional undermount two basin sink. This can be single basin or double basin, doesn't matter. Generally with stone tops and synthetic man-made tops, you're going to find undermount is the prevalent sink choice. This is what's called a farmhouse style sink or an apron sink, which is what they call the front edge of this sink. Goes in a different cabinet and the man making the uh, countertop has to be aware of exact brand and model before they can template and cut the top, but that's easily enough accomplished. So again, this is a stylistic issue. If you would prefer one over the other, just let your designer know your preference. If you would prefer a second sink someplace, be aware that there's not only the cost of the sink and the faucet, but there's the cost of additional plumbing and potentially some electric uh, and the cabinetry will have to be modified to contain a sink and not just a standard base cabinet. So 
as you get ready for a second sink, it's a big decision. Uh, make that together with your designer or architect. The seventh of the eight items that we're covering tonight is the countertop material preference. And again, we have just done a seminar that covered all of these specific material types. If you would like to go see what they all look like and what the uh, durability, the upside, the pros and cons of each material are, then go to the seminars page on the website, jimmolinelli.com, and click on the link to watch the replay of the countertop seminar. And I go through these in great detail, as well as giving you uh, an understanding of the layout of the materials from least costly to most costly. So if you have a strong preference of material type, as you get ready to do your project, this information too will help your, your architect, designer, or contractor to price the kitchen. Because granite comes in at one price, bamboo comes in at one price, quartz comes in at a very different price, and so would something uh, like a concrete countertop. So it gives us a whole different spectrum of price. So if you have any preference, please uh, put that down in your materials before you make the call. Then you can go back and watch the, the 319, the March 19th seminar on countertops and get a lot more detail on all of these items. The eighth and final item that I'm going to mention briefly is floor material preference. Now, I don't have a lot to show you on this, but the biggest question I get when I meet people that want to do a kitchen who have not remodeled before or haven't remodeled in 15 or 20 years is, I see wood floors in kitchens, in magazines, and in show homes, but isn't wood a bad choice? Isn't tile a better choice for my kitchen floor? And if you asked me that question in 1993, I would have said, yes, wood is not a good choice because the wood floors that we had at our disposal in 1993 were either hand laid and hand finished or they were pre-finished factory floors, but most of them had what was called a micro bevel. And that captured crumbs and dirt and water, and it broke the floor down. And it was not an appropriate floor for most kitchens, those grooves catching a lot of debris. But we have many, many more floor options today, and a lot of our wood floors are perfectly smooth. They're finished in a factory under ideal conditions, and their finish is guaranteed for many, many years, and they will stand up to kitchen use. Second thing that I'd like you to understand about a wood floor today is that in general, it's going to be significantly less costly than a tile floor. The cost of the tile is not very expensive, just like the cost of the wood, but the cost of installing the tile is significantly more expensive than the cost of installing the wood so the wood floor is warmer, softer, and less costly than a tile floor. Laminate, it, unlike the, the laminate countertops, uh, which are generally out of favor, laminate floors in kitchens, in, in family areas, in eating areas are in favor, especially with young children and pets. It allows for a very inexpensive floor that can be what's called floating, and it is a warm and fairly soft floor. It is very inexpensive, and it can be replaced fairly easily if the floor breaks down in 10 or 15 years and you wish to replace it. The wood floor, if it breaks down over time, is not failing. The wood itself is not failing, but the finish may fail in a long uh, tenure. And in that case, you can have that wood floor refinished for about $3 a square foot. So the wood can be refinished as many as three, four, five times in its life. And so it will be a good, durable floor for many, many years to come. Tile, the drawbacks uh, are that it is cold, that it chips and breaks, and it's very, very difficult to change a single tile or two or three tiles in a kitchen floor. 
I can't tell you how many times I've gone to visit people about a kitchen remodel and they've had a broken tile or two for 15 years and they've looked at it every time they, they look at it, they sneer and they wish they could do something about it. Um, so in addition to being very expensive floor, uh, it, it can break, it is cold and it is hard and it's the more expensive of the floors that we're looking at. Premium vinyl is a relatively new material. Uh, it's improved a lot in just the last 10 years. Uh, my knowledge of it is limited. Uh, so if you're interested in a floor other than wood or other than tile, go out to a good flooring store and preview the vinyl along with the laminates that are available today. And those will give you a good idea what you're looking at. So once again, this I'm going to, uh, in, in two weeks from now, we're going to cover flooring in more detail. Uh, and it won't just be these, it will be flooring in general. Uh, so look for that seminar to come up. So once again, the methods of cooking, the list of other major appliances, the types of in-kitchen eating, whether there will be an island or peninsula, the cabinet information that we covered, the types and number of sinks, countertop material preference that you have, and the floor material preference that you have. This is the information that I'd like you to put together anytime you're considering doing a kitchen remodel because your kitchen designer, your architect, your building contractor will be able to use that piece of information, that, that list of information, that checklist, if you will, uh, to great advantage. Um, in the notes, I, I mentioned a few of the things they'll be able to do. So if you do download the outline from tonight's project uh, or tonight's presentation, you can read those and, and understand why. They will be better able to estimate the amount of space that your current kitchen holds and how much space will be needed by those new appliances and new requests and whether or not your kitchen will hold it all. Uh, if, of course, you're blowing out a wall or you're doing this as part of an addition, then they will know how much more space to allot to the kitchen. Um, but the type of eating, whether there'll be an island or peninsula, and the type of cooking all go towards space, how much space is required. Uh, the second refrigerator or the refrigerator freezer goes towards space. The extra appliances, a third oven, um, uh, a wine chiller, uh, an ice maker, a garbage compactor, trash compactor, those things go towards more space also. So spatially, folks like me like to understand what's coming. And we do a, an assessment of what you've got and what you're asking for, and we see if there's enough room, and we can advise you very quickly what fits and what doesn't. The second benefit of putting this package of information together is that we'll be able to advise you very well, very early on, on cost, and, and whether our perception of what the cost will be works in light of your budget or doesn't work in light of your budget. It's much easier to be told you're not going to be, get it, be able to get it all done for that amount and this set of requests. And it's better to be told that early and be able to make an adjustment, whether you adjust uh, by removing something that's expensive or changing a material type or a selection type to bring it back in budget line, or whether you uh, increase the budget to make your project match your desire. Those are all valid solutions. Uh, but I can start working with you much more quickly on whether or not the budget is going to be sufficient for your request if I know these pieces of information at the beginning. So again, those eight pieces are really easy for you to put together without having to go and do a lot of shopping. If you use House or if you use Pinterest or if you just go around and, and be very observant taking some digital pictures of kitchens you like, pieces of kitchens you like, and uh, taking notes about which doors, which door styles, which door materials, which cabinet materials and finishes you like. Same is true with appliances. When you do have more information, 
if you've made your choices about which brands to use on appliances, if you know the exact model numbers and finishes, that's fantastic. Uh, it's not required before you talk to somebody, but if you know those in advance or as quickly as you do know them, turn those over to your designer as well. Because part of the puzzle of fitting a kitchen together is making sure that the electric's in the right place and the plumbing's in the right place and that the gas comes into the cooktop at exactly the right location for that cabinet. So once the layout's done, they do need to know the brand and model so that they can bring the services in in the correct location in the kitchen. So that's it. You don't have to go out and do tons of shopping to complete this list. In fact, you have to do very little. You can do most of your work on the internet. Uh, and if you need help with things like appliances, uh, ratings, then Consumer Reports is still out there. And they're a great independent group. One problem with them is that uh, when, when they're reviewing something and they post it, it usually is at the end of a model year. And there may even be a newer model out by the time you read it or go back and read it. Um, so you may not be able to match it up identically, but you'll get a good feel for their ratings and the brands and, and what's out there. So again, you don't need to rush right out and do a lot of shopping in order to put this list together. It's all about what you see, what you'd like. And if you can write your preferences down and you can get these eight items together, uh, your designer, your architect, your remodeler is going to be jumping for joy that you are so well prepared to go into your kitchen project. So that's what I've got for tonight. Next week is part two. And in part two, I'm going to introduce you to uh, a few of the techniques uh, in how you look at the space planning of a kitchen. Well, how I look at it, and I'm gonna teach you how I look at it so you start looking at it the same way. And you understand why things are arranged in certain ways and why they aren't. And what's a good way to arrange it and what isn't. And in the case of things like islands, where they will fit and where they won't and why. Everybody wants one, but not everybody can have one. And uh, so that's a hard understanding, uh, but I'm gonna teach you the basics of how to look at a kitchen and its initial setup and arrangement so that you can think this through before you go into your kitchen remodel. This video will be edited and posted for review on YouTube, my YouTube channel. It will also have a link on the seminars page on my website. So if you'd like to review it at any time or look at some of the older ones, go to jimmolinelli.com, go to the seminar page and click the link for the replay. Um, and you can go and download tonight's notes there as well and any of the notes uh, for the previous ones as well. Each Tuesday night at 9.30, I'll be doing one of these, 9.30 Eastern, I'll be doing one of these, and you can check the topics on the website and look ahead to see what will be coming up. And if you know anybody who's doing the projects that I'll be working on, please share it. Be great for them to hear it too. So that's it for tonight. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to seeing you next week on the Remodeling Professor Presents.